Welcome to the final topic of Module 1, Physical Evidence. We will begin by discussing the common types of physical evidence and recalling the various ways which physical evidence has value in an investigation. We will also define the manner in which physical evidence is created and discuss the differences between class characteristics and individual characteristics. We will then also state and study the requirements of a jury when considering physical evidence, so more or less discussing the value of physical evidence itself. So exactly what is evidence? If we get down to the very basics, there are four different types of evidence that can be involved in any type of a, a crime scene. Demonstrative, dec documentary, testimonial, and physical or real evidence. The first type of evidence is demonstrative evidence. And this is going to be evidence that demonstrates, illustrates, or recreates a tangible item or the testimony of a witness. So in many instances, the crime scene sketch that might be done from a scene itself is going to be considered demonstrative evidence. Documentary evidence is going to be evidence that is either written, sound, or video recordings. So any videos that are taken at a crime scene, um, any written notes that are taken at a crime scene, these are going to be considered documentary evidence. There is also testimonial evidence. So this is evidence that comes into court as witnesses speak under oath. And then finally, physical evidence. This is going to be evidence that exists as a tangible item. Um, and this is what the forensic scientist is usually concerned with, is the analysis of any physical evidence. This type of evidence is, is used to prove a fact um, based on the physical characteristics of that evidence itself. Physical evidence can be divided into two main classifications, um, whether it's direct evidence or whether it's circumstantial evidence. The direct evidence is going to be evidence of a fact based on a witness's personal knowledge or observation. So two good examples of this are going to be an expert that's actually testifying that a specific pen altered a document, or an expert testifying that a bullet was fired from a particular weapon. These are going to be direct evidence. Circumstantial evidence is evidence that can reasonably infer the existence or non-existence of fact. So and a good example of circumstantial evidence is going to be a fingerprint from a crime scene that's actually identified to a certain individual. The circumstantial evidence shows that that person was at one time at that scene. Or a knife that has blood matching an individual. You can assume or reasonably infer that that knife was used to stab the person whose blood was on the knife it itself. So exactly how is physical evidence produced? There are several different mechanisms that, that can bring about physical evidence to crime scenes. Um, it can either be through the change at a scene, impressions, indentions, in, in, in prints at a scene, damage, striations, through the exchange of matter, or through um, deposits being made. 
changes at a, a crime scene are going to be a very common mechanism for the creation of physical evidence. Vehicle parts that are left at the scene of a hit and run, these are obviously changes to that scene itself. Um, blood spatters on a wall, tire tread patterns that are left in a soil, and also impressions are another way that physical evidence is actually produced. Imprints are going to be your two-dimensional patterns, where indentions are going to be more of the three-dimensional type patterns. Both of these are considered impression type evidence. For your two-dimensional patterns, um, good examples of this are going to be any type of patterns that are going to be left in, in very light coatings of dust or very light coatings of dirt. Um, a lot of times they're also produced um, by blood or, or oily surfaces where your indentions are going to be a lot deeper type patterns. They're going to actually have three dimensions to the patterns themselves. So things such as tire treads that are left in soil itself, or in some instances fabric impressions that are actually pushed into um, an area of a vehicle um, during hard contact during an accident. These are good e examples of indentions. Physical evidence can also be produced just through damage. So actions such as tearing, breaking, cuts, or even a sawing type motion can create damage to items and, and create physical evidence. Striations can also be created um, to bring about physical evidence. Usually these are going to be associated with firearms examinations or tool mark examinations. A lot of the trace evidence type materials are going to be brought about um, as physical evidence because of the exchange of matter. Um, the Lockhart exchange principle discusses the fact that whenever two objects come into contact, there's always a transfer of a material. And this might, in some instances, be very slight transfer of matter, or in some instances, it might be a lot of matter that, that's transferred. It depends on the amount of contact that actually occurs. But this is another method of producing physical evidence. And finally, um, deposits can produce physical evidence. So this is a transfer of matter that occurs without contact. So things such as spray paint or pollen um, that's going to be more airbound, um, gunshot residue that is expelled from a weapon as it's fired might deposit on the hands or or other things that are in close proximity to that weapon being fired. These are examples of physical evidence that's created through um, the deposit. So the value of, of physical evidence um, can take on a, a lot of, of, of different manners. Um, it is going to be very easy to identify at crime scenes, very easy in most situations to collect. Depending on the actual analysis on the item, usually the results are going to be very specific, which can provide extremely good investigative leads to that officer. It can also provide associations between either individuals or individuals and, and objects. A lot of times it's, it's used to help prove or disprove statements. And in a lot of situations, it's also used as identifications or comparisons. 
So physical evidence is going to be perceived as something that is scientifically sound and most important that is it is extremely neutral. So there's not going to be any prejudice involved in the relay of physical evidence and the examinations to a jury. Almost anything can become physical evidence. So a lot of the, the further topics that we're going to be discussing in this course are going to involve a lot of the things documented on, on this slide. Things such as different body fluids, whether it be blood, semen, or saliva, documents, um, different drugs, whether it be powders, pills, or plant material, explosives, a lot of different um, types of trace evidence, whether it be fibers, glass, hair, paint, soil, firearms, any types of impressions, um, petroleum products, polymers. There's a lot of different types of items that can actually become physical evidence. So why do we go about examining physical evidence? We know a little bit the, the value of the evidence and, and this is where or why we examine physical evidence. It's going to provide a lot of different things to that investigation. First of all, it might provide investigative leads to the investigation. Um, it might help develop that method of operation. Um, it might associate a, several different crimes back to a single person um, through the the physical evidence, it might show that somebody's using the exact same methods to break into different businesses. Um, or it might show through um, someone being dressed similar that it's going to be the same individual. So you're helping develop that MO for the investigation, the method of operation. You can also provide a lot of investigative leads through the use of various databases that um, have physical evidence which has been entered into the databases. The physical evidence can also help establish associations. And usually these are going to be um, things where you're trying to link victims to suspects or victims back to a particular crime scene or suspects back to particular objects. You're going to establish associations between things. So something as simple as showing that a bullet came from a certain weapon that may have been used in the, the commission of a murder or hair that has been transferred from a victim to a suspect or paint that's left at a particular hit and run. All of these are going to help provide associations in that investigation. Physical evidence can also help support or disprove statements. It can also be used to help identify individuals. So using fingerprints or using dental impressions might help identify an individual. It can also be used to identify a particular substance. So it might be something as simple as identifying a powder as a particular drug or identifying paint back to a particular vehicle. It can also, depending on the evidence, provide evidential value um, through that examination of the physical evidence. So knowing that the paint might go back to a particular vehicle is important, but also it, it helps you um, determine the evidential value of that 
piece of paint. So through the examination, you might be able to determine that it's an original finish paint from a vehicle or you might be able to determine that it is a repainted um, section from a vehicle, which makes it a little bit more unique. You can also examine physical evidence to provide comparisons between items. So you can compare foreign fibers back to a crime scene to help show that a person um, was in contact with a, an item itself. A lot of these different types of examinations are going to be working with class characteristics and individual characteristics. With class characteristics, the evidence is going to be associated with a, a group of of things. So for class characteristics, if we're talking about a tool mark comparison, you might be able to determine that a specific tool mark was done by a straight edge screwdriver. Um, but you would need the individual characteristics to show that it came from one particular screwdriver. So likewise, with a shoe print, for the class characteristics, you might be able to work with the shoe print to show that it's a Nike tennis shoe that's a size 8 of a particular pattern. But then upon closer examination, you might be able to find individual characteristics to show that a print may have been made by one particular shoe one Nike shoe that's a size 8 of a particular pattern, if there's a lot of cuts and gouges or, or wear patterns in the bottom of the soles of the shoes, it might have developed a lot of individual characteristics. So these individual characteristics are going to be common to a particular source with an extremely high degree of probability. So you know, things like putting broken pieces back together. These are going to be considered more individual characteristics. And you take all of this into consideration when you're doing the examinations of your physical evidence. A lot of the analytical processes are going to be harder to put um, statistical values on. And because of, of this, a lot of it will boil down to how that forensic scientist is actually explaining the evidence to the jury itself, how that physical evidence was actually analyzed, and more specifically, through that analysis, what exactly does it mean to the investigation. So that that forensic scientist must relay things about the actual testing itself. Um, they have to prove that the tests that were conducted on the pieces of evidence were actually valid. So in, in this, they, they show that the tests are reproducible. If you run the same test on a piece of paint, you're going to get the same results every time. They also have to prove that the tests are very sensitive and very specific. The test must be appropriate for the type of evidence that is being analyzed, and the results must be very accurate. The forensic scientist also has to relay what that physical evidence means to the case itself. So they have to discuss the degree of individuality for that evidence itself. Is it evidence that that just associates class characteristics, or does that examination show a lot more individual characteristics? They also need to be able to explain the frequency of the occurrence. Um, so if there is a database available, a lot of times statistics can be applied to some types of, of evidence.
the persistence of the transferred material a lot of times will be discussed by a forensic scientist and and what that actually means. So when there's hairs that have been transferred or fibers that have been transferred, they can discuss the importance of that transfer of the material it, itself. And then also the likelihood of any alternate explanations. So in, in some instances, such as um, a a potential rape case, just the fact that there's semen there isn't going to show that it was necessarily rape. It could have been consensual sex. So the forensic scientist must be able to, to explain this. Blood that can be transferred while giving first aid versus an assault. Fingerprints that are actually left at a scene prior to a crime actually occurring. They need to be able to relate this with the actual evidence um, and so that the jury can understand what that evidence actually means to a particular crime. But the physical evidence itself is going to offer certainty and certainty is going to help show proof. And through that proof of the forensic science, that jury is going to be relayed good evidence to be able to make decisions.